This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 18. Coming up on Space Time. Studying Jupiter's water content. Building a universe without dark matter. And exactly where are we at now over the idea of life on Mars? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Juno mission has provided its first science results on the amount of water in Jupiter's atmosphere. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, estimate that the water molecules around the Jovian equator make up about 0.25% of all the molecules in Jupiter's atmosphere, surprisingly almost three times that of the Sun. Now we need to point out here that this comparison isn't based on liquid water, but on the presence of its components, oxygen and hydrogen, present in the Sun. These are also the first findings of the gas giant's abundance of water since NASA's 1995 Galileo mission suggested that Jupiter might be extremely dry compared to the Sun. An accurate estimate of the total amount of water in Jupiter's atmosphere has been on the wish list of planetary scientists for decades. The figure for the gas giant represents a crucial missing piece in the puzzle of the solar system's formation. You see, Jupiter is likely the first planet in our solar system to have formed, and so it contains most of the gas and dust that wasn't incorporated into the Sun. And the leading theories about its formation rest on the amount of water the planet soaked up. Water abundance also has important implications for the gas giant's meteorology, how wind currents flow on Jupiter, and its internal structure. While lightning, a phenomenon typically fueled by moisture, was detected on Jupiter by the Voyager spacecraft as well as other observations, an accurate estimate of the amount of water deep within the Jovian atmosphere has remained elusive. Before the Galileo probe stopped transmitting, 57 minutes into its Jovian death plunge back in December 1995, it radiated out spectroscopic measurements of the amount of water in the gas giant's atmosphere down to a depth of about 120 kilometres, where the atmospheric pressure reaches about 320 pounds per square inch. Scientists working on the data were surprised to find 10 times less water than expected. Even more astonishing, the amount of water the Galileo probe measured appeared to be increasing with depth far below where theories suggested the atmosphere should be well mixed. See, in a well mixed atmosphere, the water content is likely to be constant across a wide region and therefore more likely to represent a global average. In other words, it's more likely to be representative of water planet wide. When combined with an infrared map obtained at the same time by ground-based telescopes, the results suggest Galileo was probably just a bit unlucky, sampling an unusually dry and warm meteorological spot on Jupiter. Juno's principal investigator, Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, says Juno's surprise discovery that the atmosphere wasn't well mixed even well below the cloud tops is a puzzle which scientists are still trying to figure out. He says no one would have guessed that water could be so variable across the planet. Because of the Galileo probe experience, Juno was equipped to measure water abundance over large regions of the gas giant. Its principal instrument for this is the microwave radiometer, which observes Jupiter using six antennas, measuring atmospheric temperature at multiple depths simultaneously. It works by measuring water's absorption of certain wavelengths of microwave radiation. Really, it's the same trick used by microwave ovens to heat your lunch. The measured temperatures can then be used to constrain the amount of water and ammonia in the deep atmosphere. That's because both molecules absorb microwave radiation. The Juno science team used data collected during Juno's first eight science flybys of Jupiter to generate their findings. They initially concentrated on the equatorial region because the atmosphere there appears to be more well mixed even at depth compared to other regions. Juno was able to collect data down to a far greater depth in Jupiter's atmosphere than Galileo could, all the way down to around 150 kilometres below the cloud tops, where pressures reach around 480 pounds per square inch. Juno's highly elongated 53-day orbit is now slowly moving northwards, bringing more of Jupiter's northern hemisphere into sharper focus with each flyby. Scientists are eager to see how atmospheric water content on Jupiter varies by latitude and region, as well as what the cyclone-rich poles say about global water abundance. Juno's 24th and most recent flyby of Jupiter occurred on February the 17th, and its next will take place on April the 10th. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, building a universe without dark matter. 
And later, where are we now at with the idea of life on Mars? And later in the science report, discovery of a new species of Tyrannosaurus dinosaur. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have for the first time replicated a functioning universe without using dark matter. Instead, the team from the universities of Bonn and Strasbourg were able to carry out their computer simulation by modifying Newton's laws of gravity. A report in the Astrophysical Journal claims the resultant galaxies looked similar to those we actually see in the real world. And this is all really interesting. You see, cosmologists have always assumed that matter wasn't distributed entirely evenly after the Big Bang 13.82 billion years ago. That's because images of the cosmic microwave background radiation, a sort of first-ever snapshot of the early universe, when it had cooled enough for the first atoms to form some 380,000 years after the Big Bang, show areas of higher and lower densities. The denser places attracted more and more matter from their surroundings due to their stronger gravitational forces. And over the course of billions of years, these accumulations of gas eventually formed the galaxies we see today. An important ingredient for this hypothesis to work is dark matter. Now, scientists have no idea what dark matter is. They can't see it, but they can see its interactions with normal matter. For instance, stars orbiting around galaxies are often moving so fast that, theoretically, they should actually be flung out of the galaxies. But they're not, which means there's a lot more gravity in these galaxies than what appears to be there, and that missing matter is what we call dark matter. Now, based on these and other observations, astronomers have calculated that dark matter must make up about 80% of all the mass of the universe. That's really a bit disconcerting when you think about it. I mean, here are all these scientists thinking they've got a pretty good handle on what the universe is all about, and all of a sudden they find out that they're actually missing four-fifths of what they think's there. Dark matter is said to be responsible for that initial uneven distribution of mass in the initial moments after the Big Bang, which is seen in the cosmic microwave background radiation, and which led to the agglomeration of the gas. On the other hand, despite lots of searches, there is still no direct proof of its existence. And now, some physicists are starting to suspect that could be because it doesn't exist. Pavel Kruper from the University of Bonn suggests the answer might be that gravitational forces themselves simply behave differently to what was previously thought. This is all part of a concept known as Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND, which was first discovered by Israeli physicist Mordechai Milgram. The idea is the attraction of two masses obeys Newton's laws only up to a certain point. Under very low accelerations, as is the case in galaxies, gravity becomes considerably stronger. And this is why galaxies don't fling apart as they rotate. Kruper and colleagues developed a computer program of complex gravitational calculations using MOND to describe how the attraction of a body depends not only on its mass, but also on whether other objects are in its vicinity. They then used this software to simulate the formation of stars and galaxies, with the starting point being a molecular gas cloud several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. They then let the program run its course, and the results were remarkably close to the real universe we see around us. In fact, the distribution and velocity of the stars in the computer-generated galaxies follow the same pattern as we see in the real cosmos. The simulation also resulted in the formation of mostly rotating galaxy disks, just like the Milky Way and most other large galaxies in the universe. And that's an important difference compared to cosmic evolution simulations using dark matter, which tend to predominantly create galaxies without distinct matter disks, an important discrepancy that's difficult to explain. Another important point was that calculations based on the existence of dark matter are also very susceptible to changes in certain parameters, such as the frequency of supernovae and their effect on the distribution of matter in galaxies. However, these things have very little effect on the MON simulation. Still, it didn't correspond entirely with reality in all respects. So, Kruper and colleagues are now working to make their simulation more sophisticated and detailed. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. They've used Newtonian dynamics to come up with a potential explanation, but uh, I, I see you shaking your head. You don't seem all that convinced. Or maybe <laughs> I just didn't explain it well enough. Well, um, OK. So when dark matter first was postulated back 
in the, well, let me just um, qualify that in the modern era, if I can put it that way, because back in 1933, Fritz Vicky realised that there was something going on that we didn't understand. And he, uh, he actually is the person who coined the term dark matter. But it wasn't until 1978 when Vera Rubin, great American astronomer, wrote some papers that the world started taking notice of the idea that without this stuff, galaxies could not rotate, they would fly apart because there's not enough material in them to hold them together. And that's the beginning of the modern era of dark matter studies. Now, in the wake of that, the first thing that people said, almost, was, OK, maybe we've got gravity wrong. Maybe it's not that there's something there that we can't see, some dark matter. Maybe we've got the idea of gravity wrong. And very quickly, a scientist called Mordechai Milgram, who's in, in one of the Israeli universities, Milgram postulated the idea that our knowledge of the way gravity works, well, you know, we've got two theories of gravity. One is Newton's, one is Einstein's. They effectively give you the same answers unless you're in very high gravitational fields, in which case Newton's theory breaks down. But Newton's dynamics and Newton's gravity theory is good enough for a lot of what we do, what we understand when it comes to the rotation of galaxies and things like that, because you're not talking about very high gravitational fields. So what happened was Dr. Milgram, Professor Milgram, in fact, he produced a theory which is usually called MOND and MOND is just an abbreviation for modified Newtonian dynamics and what it means what it says is that the laws that Newton set down work really well under what you might call normal accelerations normal experiences of gravity like what we have here on earth like what we've got in most of the solar system but the suggestion is that when those accelerations get very very weak then it breaks down. Then Newton's law doesn't work. And the suggestion is that under very low accelerations, like what you get in the outskirts of galaxies, the forces that hold galaxies together, maybe the dynamical force becomes stronger, which is why galaxies might hold together under these weak accelerations. So Milgram produced this theory. It was analysed very closely in the early 1980s and eventually was not exactly discarded, but was shelved because if you put Mond into your big picture, mm. like the way clusters of galaxies behave, it doesn't work. It works for single galaxies, but with clusters of galaxies and more especially with the way we think the universe behaved in its very early period, it doesn't work. And that's why people have gone off on this wild hunt for the last 30 odd years looking for dark matter, which we haven't yet found. We ruled out things like orphan planets and black holes and dead stars very early on in the piece. And now the th thinking is that what we're dealing with is a subatomic particle or a, a class of subatomic particles that, uh, that don't interact with normal matter except through gravity. And that's very much the accepted picture with a fair bit of supporting evidence. However, it's basically something that people are looking at again. That's the bottom line, that because we haven't found what that's telling us, namely this species of subatomic particle, then you've got to look at other possibilities. So that's the backstory, Andrew. Sorry, it's taken rather oh, long. That, no, that's OK. We need, <laughs> we need to sort of get ourselves in the right position the to right move position, forward. Yeah. So the front story now is that a group of scientists, led, I think, by Dr. Pavel Krupa, who's at the Helmholtz Institute for Radiation and Nuclear Physics at the University of Bonn, uh, and also at the Charles University in Prague, has this team have essentially said, OK, let's see what happens if we do have MOND, and you've got uh, galaxies forming in an early universe. And so what they've done is run these gigantic simulations. Now, these are not uncommon. They're always done on supercomputers. I know of a few people uh, or a few institutions throughout the world that have done this kind of thing, one most uh, very notably in the University of Durham in, in northern England, uh, where you, you basically start off with what you think are the laws of physics and what you think is the material that's in the aftermath of the Big Bang. And then you run it all under the influence of gravity. And lo and behold, what you get is 
galaxies. But the thinking has been that without dark matter, you wouldn't really get galaxies that look like the ones we have today. And the new work, which uh, Dr. Krupa and his colleagues have put together, actually disproves that. Because what they've done is they've built a universe in the computer in which MOND works, modified Newtonian dynamics. And then after in the aftermath of the Big Bang, you start off with these clouds of hydrogen. You press the button and away it goes. And what do you get? Well, you get galaxies. Um, you get something very, very similar to what we see, stars and galaxies emanating within the first few million, hundred million years of the Big Bang. One of the comments that has been made on this paper is really interesting. A paper, by the way, if anybody wants to look it up, is called The Formation of Exponential Disk Galaxies in Mond by a whole succession of authors, Feb 5th of February, Astrophysical Journal. But the comment that's been made is calculations based on the existence of dark matter are very sensitive sensitive to changes in certain parameters, such as the frequency of supernovae, exploding stars, and their effect on the distribution of matter in galaxies. And we know that. We believe supernovae actually drive really quite a lot of the ingredients of galaxy formation, uh, stars exploding at the ends of their particularly short lives. Yeah. But what they say is that in the MOND simulation, these factors hardly played a role. So that's really quite interesting that MOND actually, you know, looks a little bit more stable in these simulations than the dark matter models. However, they do make the point that the simulation is only a first step. They've really made very simple assumptions about the distribution of matter in the young universe. And what Professor Krupa says is we now have to repeat the calculations and include more complex influencing factors and then we will see if the MOND theory actually explains reality. So what they're saying is that this work is really just a starting point and that they want to put in some more parameters that perhaps more closely match conditions in the infant universe and see whether we still get galaxies like the ones that have been produced by this simulation. It's really interesting stuff and I kind of applaud it in a way because even though MOND does not look like the answer to the problem of dark matter, it's still worth exploring to see what what you come out with at the end of it yeah i it's such a, a difficult thing to study because it, it, the unknowns are so significant where do you start you've got to try something so they've come up with a concept that they're yep. working with to see if it could work and then they can build on the successes and or failures of it yep. to recalibrate the the concept again, I suppose. That's right. That's exactly what it is. Um, you, it, it's, you, you could almost call it trial and error, but you're putting in, it's not completely random. You're actually putting in starting conditions, which basically bear as much resemblance as you can muster to what you thought the conditions would have been at that time. Mm. And, uh, the, you know, we've got other sources to look at that. We know, for example, a lot about the flash of the Big Bang because we can still see it yep. in microwave radiation. So all that information factors into it as well to see what you get. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, we look for the latest in the search for life on Mars, and later in the science report, more evidence linking whale strandings to the use of military sonar. All that and more still to come on Space Time. <laughs> The possibility of life on Mars has long been a subject of significant speculation among astronomers, especially those interested in planetary science or astrobiology. Today, the red planet is a freeze-dried desert, but it was once a warm, wet world with a thick atmosphere. And while Mars was a habitable planet some 4 billion years ago, its nearby planetary neighbour Earth was still cooling down from the magma ocean it was when it formed some 600 million years earlier. Under the hypothesis known as panspermia, microbial life can hitch a ride from one world to another on asteroids, meteors or comets. It works like this. A meteor slams into a planet like, say, Mars, and then blasts debris ejector containing a few surviving microbes out into space. There, these rocks can float around for millions of years until eventually getting caught up in the gravitational pull of another planet, where they then come crashing down onto its surface, together with any surviving microbes on board. And the thing is, we know that Mars and Earth have been swapping rocks for billions of years. In fact, more than 224 Martian meteorites have already been identified on Earth. 
1996, one such Martian meteorite, catalogued as ALH 84001, was discovered at Allen Hills in Antarctica. It was much older than the majority of Martian meteorites recovered on Earth so far, and it received considerable attention, including from the White House, when a group of NASA scientists led by David McKay reported microscopic features and geochemical anomalies which they suggested could best be explained by the rock having hosted Martian bacteria in the distant past. In other words, it was fossilised Martian microbes. And some of these features really do resemble terrestrial bacteria, although far smaller in size than any known life form on Earth. However, other scientists found the same structures could well have been formed through non-biological crystal mineralization processes. NASA's twin Viking landers, which touched down on the Martian surface in 1976, each carried four types of biological experiments to look for biosignatures of microbial life on Mars. The two landers were identical, so the same tests were carried out at two different places on the Martian surface. Viking 1 near the equator, and Viking 2 much further north. The landers each used a robotic arm to place soil samples into sealed test containers on the spacecraft. Despite positive results coming from one test, known as the labelled release experiment, a general assessment of the overall results seen from all four experiments from both spacecraft were best explained by simple oxidative chemical reactions with the Martian soil. You see, the Martian soil is continually being exposed to ultraviolet radiation from the sun. That's because unlike Earth, Mars doesn't have a protective ozone layer in its atmosphere. Now, all this UV radiation has caused the build-up of a thin layer of very strong oxidant in the Martian soil, and a sufficiently strong oxidizing molecule would react with the added water in the experiment to produce oxygen and hydrogen, and with the nutrients to produce carbon dioxide. And that's pretty much where the search for life on Mars ended. At least that was until June 2018, when NASA announced the detection of seasonal variations of methane levels in the Martian atmosphere. Now, methane can be produced through geological chemical reactions, but here on Earth it's far more commonly produced through biological processes such as bovine flatulence and microbial byproducts. And while there's no evidence of cows grazing on the red planet, a new search for microbial past or present life is only now getting underway. Confirmation that Mars once had habitable conditions raises the question that if life once could have existed there, did it? The chances of life on Mars is one of the features in this month's issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, which has now hit the newsstands. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. Search for life on Mars, yeah, well, this has been going on for a very long time, um, decades now. In fact, you go right back to the 1970s with the first spacecraft that was successfully landed on Mars. Vikings, NASA's yeah. Viking, yeah, Viking spacecraft. They actually carried experiments that could test... The cup of soup test. Cup of soup test, yeah. Yeah, they basically had, so they, they added some water and some nutrients and heated things up with some soil samples to see whether any uh, microbe type things in there would gobble, gobble up this food that they put in, and, and they got sort of conflicting results. Uh, they got, uh, they got no, a reaction, and, and it was very exciting for a while there. They did get a reaction for one of the experiments, which I think they couldn't repeat, uh, and the other experiments were sort of on and off. Um, and the consensus was, uh, initially there was a bit of flurry, and, oh, gee, they might, might have found life on, on Mars, but the consensus quickly changed, and most scientists have concluded that um, there was either something wrong with the experiment or they just was just some sort of... The reactionary um, soils. Uh, or, 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 yes, just, just not, not strange chemistry, but just sort of more, more reactive chemistry on, mm. in the soil of Mars than you have here on Earth. However, it has to be said that the man who invented that test that, that did... Oh, he still believes it, Mars, he? Oh, he, he still believes it, and he pushes it, and he pushes it, and he pushes it, and you never know, he could be right. Because the thing is, that after those missions there, they, they basically decided, well... And, and don't forget that this is not too long after they uh, got the first sort of orbital pictures of Mars. So we really yeah. didn't know much about the planet until they got the spacecraft there and saw that, yes, it was a apparently dead world covered in craters, thin atmosphere, very cold, the whole lot... Uh, they did those tests for life, basically concluded, no, we didn't find any life, so uh, let's forget about Mars. So they did basically forget about Mars and got on to other things for quite a long while. And then came the Allen Hills meteorite and that press conference in the Rose Garden with uh, US President Bill Clinton. Yes, that they might have found life in a meteorite that, that landed on uh, Antarctica. Allen Hills in Antarctica, yeah. Antarctica, yeah, and the meteorite came from Mars because it matches the rocks from Mars. And uh, it's one of these things, it's like the old, those who remember the cold fusion announcement back in the 1980s and then 
there was the back in the what around about the somewhere in the 2000s there was the um, oh we found life that lives on arsenic in a lake in America and that, that turned mm. out to be nonsense as well so there have been a few of these things that uh, um, the publicity got ahead of the science the one thing that really has changed over the years and and changed people's um, ideas about the possibility of life on uh, somewhere like Mars or even the moons of Jupiter is the knowledge that here on Earth life has been found in places originally thought impossible uh, even as, uh, as recently as 30, 40, 50 years ago. So you have life at the bottom of the oceans where there's no ready oxygen and this life doesn't live on oxygen. You've got life floating in, in like microbial sort of life floating in the high atmosphere. You've got life in the Antarctic ice. There, there are even things that can live inside the water in nuclear reactors. You know? um, they, they, this life is really, really... They've found life at the bottom of gold mines in kilometres underground in South Africa. Look, there's a little type of tiny creature called a tardigrade or a water bear. Yes. Little tiny microscopic things. And they took some of these up into space and did an experiment. They shoved them outside in the vacuum of space for 10 days, brought them back to Earth, still alive, and some of them reproduced. So life is really hardy. It, it, can, it can live in places that uh, we, it used to be thought it couldn't. So could it be there on Mars? Yeah, yeah it certainly could. If it's there, it's probably underground. wouldn't be living on the surface because... It'd be irradiated. Well, yeah, well, having just said that life is a lot hardier than, than uh, we think, uh, the surface is not a really good place because of all the ultraviolet light from the sun and uh, cosmic rays and things. But, yeah, underground, there could be lots of deep, hot biosphere. Uh, we, have a deep, we have a deep, hot biosphere here. Well, Mars used to be a warm, wet world. It was so until about 4 billion years ago when, when the uh, core solidified, and uh, well, mostly solidified, and uh, that allowed the planet's magnetosphere to disappear slowly, and, uh, and that allowed the, the sun to blow away most of Mars's atmosphere, and that's sort of and what we're cold. left with now. Yeah, it got yeah, really yeah. cold. Then it got really cold, yes. Yeah. So there, there could be a deep hot biosphere on Mars because we have a deep hot biosphere here on Earth. I've seen it suggested, I don't know, I mean, not, you can't really do the sums on this, but someone has suggested that if you added up the mass of all the life that lives underground on Earth, we're not talking about burrowing animals, we're talking about microbes and things, mm -hmm. uh, going kilometres down, it, it could actually weigh more than all the life that lives on the surface of the planet. So, so who knows? Anyway, we talk about uh, the Martian underground in the February-March issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Really interesting stuff, so um, check that out if you're interested in life and on other planets. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The 13th Cygnus cargo mission carrying fresh supplies and experiments has successfully docked with the International Space Station 414 kilometres above the Western Pacific Ocean. The Cygnus 13 had launched two days earlier aboard a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the mid-Atlantic coast. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. Engine start. The top Antares NG-13 mission from Wallops Flight Facility. Engines at 100%. Attitude nominal. TBC is nominal. Core pressures are nominal. Power subsystem nominal. Altitude 10,000 feet. Velocity 1,100 feet per second. Max Q, attitude nominal. Altitude 50K feet. Engine steady, 100%. Core BNG-3 activated. 3,000 feet per second, attitude nominal. Coming up on two minutes into the flight, they've passed maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. 100,000 feet altitude. Engine steady, 100%. A minute and a half to go in first stage performance. Engine's at 100%. Coming up on three minutes into flight. Low throttle down initiated. Miko slew maneuver initiated. Engine's at 55% and nominal. 14,000 feet per second, main engine cutoff. Main engine cutoff confirmed. Standing by for stage one separation. Upper ACS enabled, stage one sep. Stage one separation confirmed. The next milestone is fairing separation, which will come in about 40 seconds. Altitude, 100 kilometers. Roughly 15 seconds to stage two ignition. Fairing separation confirmed. Fairing separation. Four minutes into flight. Interstage separation. Interstage separation confirmed. Attitude nominal. Stage two ignition. And stage two ignition Attitude is nominal. confirmed. Stage two is that solid rocket fuel that will burn for about three minutes and 43 seconds. Burnout will come about seven minutes and nine seconds into flight. Six kilometers per second velocity. 
uh, 183 kilometers altitude, heading into burnout. Stage two burnout. Stage two burnout confirmed. Cygnus now moving about 16,822 miles per hour. ACS enabled. Beginning maneuver to acquire payload separation attitude. Uh, the vehicle will continue to coast until conditions are met for payload separation. Cygnus separation will come about nine minutes and four seconds into flight. ACS and power subsystems nominal, attitude nominal, altitude 197 kilometers. We have payload separation. And spacecraft separation confirmed. Cygnus was grabbed by the space station's robotic arm and docked to the Earth-facing port on the Unity module as the orbiting Arpus was flying south of New Zealand. The supply ships carrying some 3.4 tonnes of scientific experiments and equipment, including a mobile space lab, tissue and cell culturing facility that's designed to perform sophisticated microbiological experiments critical for determining how microgravity affects human physiology. Also aboard was MOKI, a new miniature scanning electron microscope with a spectrograph designed to image and measure micro and nanoscale structures. There's also a new experiment to examine bone loss in microgravity a phage evolution experiment to better understand the effects of microgravity and cosmic radiation on bacteriophages, and the Sapphire 4 experiment to study how fire develops and grows in different materials and under different environmental conditions in space. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that ice loss in Antarctica could contribute another 58 centimetres to sea level rise this century, becoming a major risk for those living near the coast. The findings are based on a report in the journal Earth System Dynamics, which carried out detailed projections on the likely effects of global warming based on current rates of temperature increase. Scientists found that Antarctica's contribution to future sea level rise was likely to be between 6 and 58 centimetres before the turn of the century. The authors say that while the potential range is large, if global warming is limited to an increase of just 2 degrees, that range narrows to between 4 and 37 centimetres. A new study has found that eating a Mediterranean diet for a year boosts the type of gut bacteria linked to healthy ageing, while at the same time reducing those bugs associated with harmful inflammation in older people. A report in the journal Gut analysed the intestinal microbiome of more than 600 people aged between 65 and 79, both before and after 12 months of either eating their usual diet or consuming a pure Mediterranean diet, which is rich in fruits, nuts, vegetables, legumes, olive oil and fish, and low in red meat and saturated fats. The findings support the idea that simply improving your day-to-day -day diet can change gut bacteria, which in turn has the potential to promote healthier ageing. Paleontologists have discovered a new species of Tyrannosaur dinosaur at a dig site in Alberta. The giant meat-eating theropod, which has been named Thanatotheristus de Grutorum, was identified from a partial skull and upper and lower jaw bones. A report in the journal Cretaceous Research claims that, based on the finds, the newly identified species would have been around 8 metres long. It was discovered in 79.5 million year old Cretaceous period strata, filling a gap in science's understanding of Tyrannosaur evolution. Scientists have identified more evidence linking whale strandings to the use of military sonar. A report in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B examined an incidence of submarine tracking military sonar and documented whale strandings near the Marinara Archipelago in the Western Pacific Ocean. The authors found about half of all the strandings, four out of eight, occurred within six days of the naval anti-submarine operations. The study supports the theory that naval sonar adversely affects whale navigation. Well, it's now official. Research has shown that junk food really can mess with your brain. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science, are based on researchers who fed lean, healthy young people a Western-style junk food diet of waffles, milkshakes and fast food for a week. Boy, where can I sign up? Now, compared to those on a controlled diet, the authors found that after just one week, participants suffered impaired function of the hippocampus, that's the area of the brain that supports memory and appetite and this caused them to experience a greater desire to eat junk food, even when they were full. The authors say the hippocampus normally suppresses the urge for more food when you're full, but the junk food diet seems to undermine the self-control by increasing desire. 
Well, it seems despite all the warnings, there are lots of people out there that still believe the fake news they read online without bothering to check the validity of the story or its source. A new study has found far-reaching conspiracies between governments and medical communities and the idea of ditching common medical treatments of life-threatening diseases for unproven cures are still all the rage for an ever more gullible public. It seems doctors hiding cancer cures, taking berries instead of vaccines, and claims that eating instant noodles can kill you were the most popular medical stories of 2019. Pity they're all fake. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the 50 most popular fake health stories got over 12 million shares, mostly on Facebook. Clearly a font of all knowledge. What people should consider when they're looking at a particular claim, supposedly scientific claim. Now, the differentiation between science and pseudoscience is that science follows a process called the scientific method amongst various processes, and pseudoscience doesn't. And the big difference comes down to uh, how much they use these particular criteria to show whether they're reputable or not. A number of these things are things you should be looking out for. None of them are perfect. There are certainly loopholes in most of them. But if you have one after the other, after the other, after the other, it should give you more confidence that what you're looking at a particular claim is genuine. The first is that it's published at a reputable journal and therefore peer-reviewed by independent researchers who should know what they're talking about. Not every journal is reputable. There's a lot of shonky journals out there that don't do any proper peer review. Even in some uh, noted journals have had errors where they publish things and uh, they turn out to be lacking in good scientific rigour. The classic one, Andrew Wakefield's Scare Tactics of Measles Causing Autism was published in the Lancet and that was later rejected or taken off. So the, even these learned journals can actually make mistakes. The process science builds on previous work. It contributes to future work. If it radically contradicts something, you have to have a look at it very closely and really find out if, if it stands up. But if science builds up one thing upon another until you have a pretty good, not 100%, never is, but a very good belief that this would be true. So peer-reviewed, good publications, building up, not alone. Anything that promises you a panacea or miraculous cure, you're probably reading about online or in the daily press. Anything that promises that, forget it. <laughs> it's unlikely because it doesn't happen that way. But people sort of grab onto uh, anything they can to sort of try and find, a, especially in the medical area, try and find a cure, etc. So something superlative is announced with breathless uh, enthusiasm in the press. Be very, very careful. Be careful of researchers who have a vested interest. That happens a lot too, unfortunately. But yeah, by and large, people do disclose their vested interest where they're getting their funding from. A single study doesn't work, or it can work, but you've got to get a lot more than just a single study to actually make it very convincing. Science is about as you said, about the build-up of evidence, not about one particular outlier. Reasonable sample size, you'd be horrified to know sometimes how small a sample scientists or pseudoscientists use to prove a particular case. And if you just say, well, that's not representative, it can't be. And of course, the other problem with sample sizes, especially if it involves people, if you're a scientist working at a university, your people sample size is probably going to be a bunch of grads who are trying to make a bit of money. <laughs> I know. It can be very dodgy. Like all of these things, none of these sort of criteria are perfect. Supposedly the subject should be independent people off the street, if you can, and in decent numbers. So if the people who are vetting the research proposal are doing the right thing, they will say, you can't use PhD students in your department as your sample. It just doesn't work. It's not fair. You've also got to look at the statistics. Do they mean anything? So you have to watch out for percentages and statistical significance and all those sort of areas. When you're an average person, who's got a busy day, kids to look after, what have you, you're not going to go searching through scientific papers to work out what's right and what's wrong. You're going to read an article online or something. You're going to hope that the source you looked at to get your information is reputable. And, and that's dodgy as well. I mean, how many times do programs like A Current Affair run magic cure stories? That's a problem, of course. You know, that A Current Affair is approached by a particular PR company to say, my client has this amazing product that you really should be putting out there. And if it's amazing, their ears prick up, etc. And they think, oh, fine, I'll cover it. There's no follow-up, generally speaking. There's no proper alternative views expressed. It's just this amazing miracle cure, a diet cure. And of course, it's not just a current affair. I mean, SBS just won a Ben Spoon Award for a, a program they were doing. And this program had serious issues in the judging of some of the things that were being put forward as medicine or myth. But yeah, mainstream media, by and large, because mainstream media is not scientific publications. They aren't peer-reviewed. I mean, what you do in, in, in your program is you look at other sources which have been peer-reviewed and has been yeah. studied and you use qualified people. So even if you're not the expert on everything, but I know you are, but uh, yeah, and, and for me too, 
who made sure the, <laughs> same here as the editor of the Skeptic magazine. I'm not the font of all wisdom, and I do not know everything. But I look to other people who do know more, and they look to other people who know a hell of a lot more. And basically, you reach a stage where the information you get, as long as it comes from broad range of areas, etc., you build up with science. It is a lot more reputable than one person sitting in their garage saying, "I found ginger as a cure for cancer." That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audioboom, Podbeam, Android, CastBox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com or from your favourite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double-episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 